Hello and welcome to another edition of Tuesday with the Disability Policy for All. Today we have the great and honor interviewing Tom Harkin, who is the former who is a former senator from Iowa and the former chairman of the Health Committee. The Health Help Committee stands for Health, Education, Labor, and Pension, and it's a committee of the issues that matter the most to us. To us. So welcome, oh, nice to Senator Harkins. Thank you. Um, the first question I wanted to talk, to ask you is. What was it like growing up with a brother with a, who had disabilities? Well, what it was like was sort of uh, trying to get to understand how to speak with him. My brother was deaf, and at a young age he was sent away from home uh, across the state to go to a special school for deaf, Iowa School for the Deaf. And then, of course, he had to learn a whole language, sign language, but we didn't know sign language. So when he would come home, we would have to learn to speak sign language. And, uh, and then watching, watching him later on in life and knowing how he had been limited in what he could do, what he was told he could do, um, when he was in school, they told him he could be one of three things. He could be a baker, a shoe cobbler, or a printer's assistant. He said he didn't, he said he didn't want to do any of that stuff. So they said, okay, you're going to be a baker. So that was, that was his limita the limitations they imposed on him. Uh, I remember one time, oh, and, and, and people in those days, Liz, used to refer to that school as the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb. My brother had said to me one time, he said, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. But now again, a lot's changed since then. But that's what I learned when I grew up was just how limiting society was for people with disabilities. My brother, he said to me one time, he said, he said to me another thing, he said, he said, there's only one thing I know I can't do. I can't hear. He said, there may be other things I can't do, but I don't know, because I haven't <laughs> tried them. <laughs> I just know there's only one thing I can't do. But everybody else came to think that I can't do anything else. And so I learned a lot from growing up with a brother like that. And did his teachers think that he, did, did his teachers think that he was dumb or? Well, I don't think his teachers thought that. Uh, and certainly the school wasn't called that, it's just that that's what people called it. Because if you were deaf, they referred to you as deaf and dumb, because you couldn't speak. Hmm? Um, but I think his teachers at that time in the deaf school, um, again, they just had this thought that if you were deaf, you could do certain things. You could, you know, sell pencils at a someplace, or you could, you know, be a baker. Or, that's it. You couldn't go on to do other things. That was just uh, terribly limiting uh, in, in, in that aspect. That's, that's unbelievable. Um, now I wanted to talk about the ADA, which we just celebrated the 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. yeah. as, as a senator and, and as an advocate, can you share with the audience the importance of the ADA, which is a historical act? Ah. Well, Liz, here's how I try to explain it to people that don't understand it that well. Uh, they all, people all understand, for example, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act said it's, it's illegal, it's unlawful to discriminate against someone because of their race, their religion, their ethnicity, their sex, whether male or female, um, or religion. 
You, you can't discriminate against people because of that. But they left out people with disabilities. So until from 1964 until 1990, all that time up till 1990, it was perfectly legal to tell someone with a disability what they could do or they couldn't do or they, they couldn't eat in the restaurant. You, you know, someone come to a restaurant with a disability, the wheelchair or, or, or an intellectual disability, they could refuse to serve you. And that was perfectly legal. And finally, through the, through the 70s, when I first came here, the 80s, uh, uh, the, the, the whole disability rights movement said, wait a minute, we also need a broad coverage of a civil rights bill. And that's what the Americans with Disabilities Act is. It, it covered, and, it, and we did a little bit more too, Liz. We did, not only did it make it illegal, but we put in there provisions that mandated certain things like transportation, accessible buses, accessible trains. Um, all new buildings built in America have to be designed to be accessible. Ramps need to be installed. Um, uh, new technologies need to be incorporated. Uh, uh, things even like talking stoplights for crossings and things like that. Um, and then we also mandated that employers Companies had to make what we call reasonable accommodations so that people with disabilities could work and be fully employed. So it's a little bit broader than the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and uh, with, with some of the things in there that, 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 that again, break down the barriers, the artificial barriers uh, for employment of people with disabilities. Thank you. That was interesting. Um, ADA is 25 years old, and I have noticed, and I imagine you have too, that we're not at the point that I was hoping. For and maybe when you develop ADA 25, wrote 20, um, ADA, um, you didn't, um, you weren't hoping. You, so what, what else do we need to accomplish to make that dream of full inclusion to be a reality? Well, you're right. We're not. We've come a long way, yes. and we've done some good things. Uh, our country has changed a lot. Um, we still have what I call some artificial barriers, uh, attitudinal barriers, that people without disabilities still have. We're getting better as a society. We're getting better. But the, the, the one, the two, see there were four goals of the ADA. Uh, there was full participation, equal opportunity, uh, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. Those are the four things of, of, of the ADA. Yeah. Well, on the first two, full participation, yeah, we've done pretty good. Equal opportunity, a lot better. But those final two, we, we need to do better. Independent living, uh, and we need to have structures that again, enable people to live on their own. You know there's still a bias in Medicaid. Yes. You know that, Liz, yes. right? So if you qualify, if you qualify for nursing home care under Medicaid, Medicare must, has to pay for that. But if you want to live on your own in the community with supportive services, Medicaid doesn't have to pay for that. So there's a Medicaid bias and there's a bias for, for, for nursing home care in Medicaid, that's got to change. Well, that's one big one, so that we provide the same support that you'd get in a nursing home to a person who wants to live on their own in the community. The last one is, is economic self-sufficiency. That just means jobs. We have not done very well at that. It's just it sticks in my throat. It's just bad. Uh, and 
since I've retired, one of the things I'm focusing on now is that last aspect, increasing employment of people with disabilities uh, in all kinds of different occupations uh, across the country. Uh, we've just got to do better. That's, that's, that's one of the big goals. Thank you. And I have to agree with you. I think the jobs are so important. Mm -hmm. um, you have talked about the ADA generation and what is it mm -hmm. and why is, why is this generation so important? Well, you're, okay, as I talk about the ADA generation, that's young people who have been born and raised, who have disabilities either from birth or accident or intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, physical disabilities, or a combination thereof, but who have come of age under the ADA. Now, perhaps in my brother's time, long before, they were so beaten down by society that they kind of lost hope. They lost, uh, they lost sort of the, 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 the dream that they could actually do something else. This ADA generation though, where well, they've come up under the ADA where the doors are open, the barriers are breaking down, and where you can't discriminate against them, they're not going to take a back seat on the bus. They're going to be much more aggressive. They're going to demand their rightful place in society. They're going to demand better jobs, not at sub-minimum wage, but at equal pay jobs in integrative uh, employment, competitive employment. And so that's why my hope for the future is, is, is much better now, because you've got this whole new generation coming up. They're smart, they're aggressive, uh, they're not taking no for an answer. Um, and so that's why I think this new generation is going to even take it even much further. We're going to, I think the next 25 years, you're going to see more people with disabilities in the professions. You're going to see them more in, in hierarchy of jobs around the country. I think you'll see more of them in politics and government. Uh, and I think more and more what we're trying to do is to come to this full inclusion society uh, where a, and this has always been my goal, so that, it, that, that a person is not judged by his or her disability, but by their ability. What can they do? Uh, and that's what this new generation, that's what they're exhibiting, what we can do. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions that I miss or that you would like to talk about? Gosh, no, I think you covered just about everything. Again, and my hope, again, is also, well, there is one thing, Liz. Um, my hope is to expand this concept that we have of, of, of full inclusion, equal opportunity, economic self-sufficiency, independent living, globally, globally. One of the bad things that happened before I left the Senate was that we did not ratify the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Over 150 nations have signed on to this. We haven't. It's terrible. That's a, it's a bad mark on us. But other countries are now stepping forward and saying, hmm, we got to do better. So hopefully we can take this concept and, and expand it globally so that uh, People with disabilities in other countries will have the same kind of opportunities that we're now st starting to see here in the United States. Uh, so that's my hope for, for down the road, getting it more globally. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz. And if you have any questions about this, this or any other policy issues, Go to the AUCD webpage and look for this for this week's in brief. And if you have any questions or comments about this week's Tuesday with Liz, please leave them in this space below. Thanks, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks.
Thanks, Thanks. Senator Hagen. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, I, very much. I enjoyed being here. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.